is there's this very special young lady here today. Let me see if this is changing. Okay, it's not. Wait. You know, this thing only does this when Ellen's preaching. <laughs> there we go. Thank you. <laughs> Come, Tolo. And Ceci. Come up. So we have this amazing young lady. Yeah, you can come stand up, Pindi. You're her leader. You've got to pray for her. <laughs> no, okay, I'll pray. So this amazing young lady and her mother, okay, stand there by your mom. There we go. Uh, is going to Croatia to represent South Africa in the World Dance Masters. And, and if, if you were at the quiz, you would see that we need this kind of talent because they made me do the Macarena and I messed it up completely. <laughs> so we're very grateful for talent like this. So can, can we stretch out our hands and just bless this amazing young lady? Lord, we just, we just pray for Tolo. Lord, that you would be with her. God, that you would bring increase to this. Um, Lord, thank you for, for Ceci, that you would bless her as well. And as they travel, we pray, God, that you would take them and bring them safely. And Tolo, we, we just bless you in the name of Jesus. We thank the Lord for you and we just say more, Lord. And that you would both go and be salt and light. We are sending you from this place to make a difference for the kingdom. So go, dance well, and we are so proud of you. We can't wait to hear how it went. So the Lord bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well done. How amazing is that, huh? Yeah, you see, so, so you know, I, I sang, and I'm not allowed to sing in church anymore, because apparently I sing in between keys, and then I danced at the quiz, and apparently I'm not allowed to dance either, so fortunately there are people with other gifting in the church, you see. Okay, then another really, really incredible, special, amazing announcement I'd like to make, and I don't know where the young man is now, I don't see him anywhere, but... He's outside smoking. No, he's not. <laughs> Ron. Where is he? There he is. <laughs> okay, so, so he's just sitting there. You all know what he looks like. Okay, there he is. It's that guy. The guy that was playing guitar this morning. Oh, there's a, I put a photo up. I forgot. Yeah, that's the guy. So, so part of this um, ordination... Is a, it's, you know, we're going to talk about it. I'll explain it all. But be here on the 26th of May to celebrate this young man as we receive him, as we bless him, as we... You know, it's, this is a, it's a big deal. And it's not just like Andrew's here now and he's the new senior pastor and he's made this, this decision. It's been a conversation Alan and Shaul and the team have walked with Ron for years and years. And it is, you know, how it works within the vineyard is uh, we are recognized by the local church, the elders, and the regional team and the national team. And we have, and the? Congregation. And the congregation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the congregation, yeah. So, so there's a recognition, but from our national office, Dave Pedersen, I serve on the national team with him. Other senior leaders on the national team recognize this, and we're going to be laying hands on the man and, uh, and receiving him and just ordaining the guy. So, so that is going to be a major celebration, a milestone in Ron's life. Ron, we love you, brother, and we look so forward to see what the Lord's going to be doing. Um, so that's that announcement. And I only have one more, and then I'll hand over to Ellen. Okay. Um, the, the conference. I want to ask if anyone is able to host a delegate. One person. If you've got a couch or a sleeping bag or a, a camper cot or something. Um, there, there are a, a couple of people that need to be hosted. Um, if you're able to host them, it just means giving a simple breakfast and making sure they get here in the morning and get back in the evening. So it would be for the Thursday night, the Friday night, and that's it. It's two nights. Um, there's a few people. One of our speakers actually needs accommodation. Um, so uh, it would be really, really wonderful. So if you, if you can, if you've got space, 
if you're able, and you know what, they can also, if, if you're leaving for work too early, you can give them some oats so easy and stick them in an Uber, it's fine. <laughs> okay? These are, no, no, these are amazing people. They are servants of the Lord. You're not having the, you know, it's not like you're having Alan, the holy and anointed one, staying in your house, you know? <laughs> Okay, no, I'm being naughty. No, really, these are wonderful people, and it's an opportunity to get to know some, some incredible people. So if you are able to host, uh, we, are, we do need hosts, please. Just if you fill it in, let the office know, just uh, get hold of Debbie or uh, Lindy and just or fill in a form at the info zone. Uh, we would appreciate that. Okay? Is that good? Yeah. So what are we looking for? Just checking. Hosts. What's happening on the 26th of May? Ron. Okay, just checking. Okay, so now I'm done. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I'm not. No, no, no. Just to say, if you haven't signed up for the new members course, uh, I'm going to be teaching the new members course straight after the service. There is a lunch. Um, there is still a little bit of space available. Some people have registered. Uh, we've got, we, I think we've got about, we had about 25 people who said they were keen and we've, we've catered for 20 um, but only, I think, 14 or 15 have confirmed. So we do have a few spaces. So we want to find out more about our church, about coming into membership, becoming family, um, and just integrating your life um, into the life of the church. Please join us um, straight after the service. There will be lunch served by Auntie Jessie. God bless her. Um, I told her yesterday I've been fasting since Friday because um, she feeds us well. So if, you, if you'd like, please feel free to join. Okay. I've got two sermons for you this morning. The first one is extremely short. It goes like this. If you are perfect, will you just cross your fingers like this? Don't let anybody else see. And then I'll pray for you. And you can go home. That's the first sermon. So all the perfect people, here comes my prayer. Lord, Show them how mistaken they are. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> right. Tighten your seatbelt. Because you're going to need to. I'm dealing with the subject today, living out of weakness and vulnerability. And I'm doing part one. And if you think this is tough, wait till next week. Part two. There are two key words that we're going to examine today, briefly. The words are weakness and vulnerability. And I want to start looking at the word weakness because it refers to a state or quality of being weak. Hands up those of you who are weak. Oh, we had, we've got about 25 honest people here. Right. Lack of strength, fragile, or feebleness, an inadequate or defective quality, as in a person's character, slight fault, flaw, or defect. <laughs> right. Okay. The English word vulnerable is derived from Latin and it means to wound. And it means being capable of being physically or emotionally wounded. Being open to criticism, attack, or damage. Now, here's the good news. You, you like good news, don't you? Yes, sir. Wonderful. Everyone alive in our fallen world has been wounded in life. Hands up if you haven't been wounded, because I promise you today I will do it. <laughs> We've all been wounded, okay? And so, in fact, in vineyard circles, we refer to ourselves as wounded healers. None of us are perfect. 
But God uses us in our brokenness to bring healing and wholeness to others as he continues his wonderful work in our lives. Now, I just want to make something very clear as I go through this today, that weakness and vulnerability have nothing to do with willful sinning. I'm not talking about messes in our lives because of sin. I'm talking about weaknesses. So we're not addressing the subject of sin today, so you can go, he's not going to pick on me much. <laughs> Don't believe it. Okay, <laughs> let's, let's get into it. Now, the Western culture places a high value on power and influence, isn't that so? Yeah. We are dazzled by celebrities, famous artists, and those with thousands of social media followers. It's so nice to listen to people as they say, well, I've got a thousand followers on... I say, right. Look over your shoulder and see where they are. <laughs> oh. Okay. <laughs> We attribute great power to the wealthy and successful and to those who are brilliantly intellectual or gifted athletically. The guy who hits a golf ball right over there, close to the hole. <gasps> How wonderful. <Not> Tony. Tony. <laughs> <laughs> we, we value cutting edge innovators and entrepreneurs who uh, chart paths for the future, don't we? Now, unfortunately, the 21st century church also places a high value on power and influence. And especially when ministries attack, attract large crowds, have high impact and visibility, and boast impressive buildings and staff, we, dazzle, we are dazzled by our own versions of celebrities, famous artists, and those with visibly high gifts. And so, famous popular church leaders, singers, and so on, are given honor and glory. We never speak about the people who sing between the cracks, only those who are big chart numbers out there. Hey, Andrew, it's tough, eh? <laughs> now, because we are not aware or know that there's an alternative, we allow ourselves and our ministry to be seduced by the world's definition of power. That's you and me. You and I try to avoid any sign of weakness and vulnerability. Is it a lie or is it true? It's true. So let me give you a little bit of my background. So that you know, I come from a perfect family, <laughs> therefore I am perfect. It was a perfect mess family, and I'm a perfect mess. <laughs> now, I grew up in a dysfunctional home. My dad was an alcoholic, and he was a violent person. As kids, we experienced an, uh, regular and severe physical beatings. I, I don't want to describe them, because somebody will dig him out of his little box, and um, give him a hiding. My mom struggled to keep the home a place of peace. But eventually she was emotionally and mentally affected by the constant drama in the house. One of the saddest times in my life was when I had to admit her to verse copies because she had lost it wasn't a great thing. Now, she was the parent who introduced us kids, four brothers, all perfect, um, to the church and to Jesus. My dad was an unbeliever. Now, the Lord called me into ministry when I was 13. That's a couple of years ago. Um, <laughs> my dad was totally opposed to this happening. And so he made sure I went to an apprenticeship at Isco as a Mulright. His, his words were, you're not going to go into the church. They don't pay you. They don't respect you. They treat you like rubbish. You go and do something decent with your life. That was his understanding of the church. 
uh, he never met you guys. <laughs> so um, I had emotional and development gaps that caused me to feel different and insecure around other kids, especially the kids who came from peaceful homes. I mean, our home, you were ducking all the time because things were flying. I mean, half bricks, cups and saucers, plates, knives. It was a nice place to be. We really learned how to play dodge them. Okay, and if you didn't dodge them, you were in trouble. So I carried terrible secrets from home and felt out of step with everyone else who spoke of home happiness. You know, when I, when I heard people talking about how nice it is at home, I was broken inside. Now, even after theological college and ordination, I still felt inadequate. And through all my years in ministry, I have been aware of my weakness. Sis. Because there's not one, <laughs> there's a couple. Now, my understanding and expectation was that no obstacle could hinder what God wanted to do through me. I still believe that. He would not have called me to a particular work if I could not fulfill it with his help. And so in spite of how I felt, I knew God was going to take me through it. He wouldn't call me if he wasn't. And so I kept reminding myself over and over, greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world. And I was determined to remain strong and faithful. And God has given me zeal, talents, and a good ministry experience. Now, a major shift began in my life after almost seven years of leading out of strengths and successes. When Charles and I had been married for seven years, we had come to a place where we con were considering divorce. And I was not a nice guy to know then. Because I had taken chalk and marked every piece of furniture exactly in half. We were going to share everything. The couch in half. <laughs> Dining room table in half. Plates in half. <laughs> oh, man. And um, that would have brought my ministry to an end. As, a divorce, as divorce priests were a no-no in the Anglican denomination at that time. So we were kind of, um, I was kind of desperate because I thought, okay, back to Isco I go. But God stepped in and we really went through a great struggle and a journey of healing and restoration. And it began with me. So often we expect the other person to change first, right? Isn't that true? Yeah. yeah. But God didn't pick on Charles, he picked on me. And I want to share with you what he did. Now we're in this broken mess. And he says to me, <laughs> I want you to run a marriage enrichment course. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you, Lord. <laughs> So I studied 40 books on marriage. I learned a lot. And then when I ran the course, I was learning a lot. And obviously, it must have done something because we're still an item. <laughs> or something. Okay? <laughs> and so, God dealt with my weakness, my mistakes, my vulnerability, my failures. And he helped me to break the power of the past. Now, you need to, if you weren't here the last two Sundays, you need to catch up on David and Andrew's sermons because they dealt with the power of break, breaking the power of the past, getting out of it. Question, did I become perfect? No. Did this disqualify me from remaining in ministry? No. Now that might baffle you. Why didn't God make me perfect? Well, 
we all have flaws in our character. You have flaws in your character. How many flaws do you, does your building have? <laughs> if you for one moment believe that you have no flaws in your character, may God have mercy on you. I'm serious about that. But when we're in Christ, we are weak, personally, but strong in His power. Amen. Now, I want to just share the example of Paul for a moment. Because this passage is probably one of the best passages to teach us how to live out of weakness and vulnerability. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 5. He says, and we're coming in to an argument that he is you know, projecting. He says, that experience is worth boasting about, but I'm not going to do it. I will boast only about my weaknesses. If I wanted to boast, I would be no fool in doing so, because I would be telling the truth. But I won't do it. Because I don't want anyone to give me credit beyond what they can see in my life or hear in my message. Even though I have received such wonderful revelations from God. So to keep me from becoming proud, I was given a thorn in my flesh. A messenger from Satan to torment me and to keep me from becoming proud. Three different times I begged the Lord to take it away. Each time he said, my grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. So now I'm glad to boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ can work through me. That's why I take pleasure in my weaknesses and in the insults, hardships and persecutions and troubles that I suffer for Christ. For when I am weak, I am strong. And so Paul considered his great weakness to be his badge of apostleship and authority from God. I mean, he could have, you know, shared of the great miracles God had done and all that kind of stuff, but he shared his weaknesses. And he says, that's my badge of authority. And so much so that he boasted in it, arguing that this was how and why the power of Jesus flowed through him. He said, because I'm weak, God's power has flow flows through me. Now, for most people... Bragging about abilities, accomplishments, and positive experiences is a way to build themselves up in the eyes of others, to make much of themselves so that others will make much of them. And you've obviously, like me, been around people who um, like to tell you how good they are, how brilliant and talented and gifted and all that kind of stuff. But Paul found himself boasting but he was boasting in a way we usually don't think of boasting. He was boasting of his weakness, of his difficulties, and of his troubles. Very different to our normal um, way of life. And it's really God's cultural, a countercultural path to power and strength. If we take the world's way of boasting, we'll never know the power of God in our lives. But if we go God's way and allow our weakness and vulnerability to be there, then he becomes our strength and we do great things for the kingdom. And so we often miss, what we often miss is an understanding of what constitutes power and strength from a biblical perspective and how radically different that is from the cultural understanding. And so I believe we need a revelation of who God is and the way that he works. But the qualities of weakness and vulnerability are rarely encountered in our world, even more sadly in the church. There's a lot of stuff going on politically at the moment. Have you heard one political leader get up and say how weak and vulnerable he or she is? No, they're all gonna give you jobs. They're all going to answer all the problems of South Africa in one quick sweep. 
That's the thinking of the world. It's not the thinking of God nor the church. So we need to have a theology of weakness. We need to understand that weakness and vulnerability is okay with God and with each other. I know that bounces off you a little bit, doesn't it? I don't want people to know I'm weak. Well, you don't even have to tell them. They can see it. That's the truth of life. You only have to be with a person for 10 minutes and you'll pick up weaknesses. You've got to be with me for two minutes and you got them. And so scripture constantly shows God choosing to work through weak, flawed, and imperfect people. You just take the characters of the Old Testament and the New Testament. I mean, I, I sort of say, God, what's wrong with you? Couldn't you find somebody who's better? <laughs> he takes the weak things of this world and confounds us by his way of working. Now, as I shared a couple of times already at the leadership handover service, my words to Andrew were these. I said, you pick up a church that I've lived for 40 years, but I must tell you, it's not yet the church that I would like it to be. It's far from being perfect. I've realized that my gifting was to bring the church to this stage. Your gifting is going to take the church into the next phase of what God has ordained for Centurion Vineyard. Do you guys remember that? Yes. Well, let's take it from another angle. I certainly would not have said those words if I did not realize my weaknesses and vulnerability. If I was proud and defensive, I could have said something like this. And please, don't laugh. Andrew, you lucky man. You're getting 40 years of successful church growth and an almost perfect church. It's going to be very hard for you to follow my act. But just hoping you can become a worthy senior pastor of CVCF. <laughs> Anyone who speaks like that needs a pair of concrete slippers. <laughs> the 12 disciples. Think about them for a moment. They were not known for their scholarship or knowledge. They were not theologians. Nor did they seem to have intellectual abilities. I mean, great intellectual abilities. They had attitude problems. They showed lack of faith at times. They made mistakes and failed miserably at times. They seemed to be slow learners, spiritually dense at times, and had so many character flaws. Yet each of them was personally selected and called by Jesus Christ. Who were these people? Just normal people like you and me. We're no different to them. And so I want to turn to our, our greatest model, who is Jesus, okay? I want you to think about it. God came to earth, not in a flashy show of signs and wonders, but as an infant born into poverty and obscurity. After living as a refugee in Egypt, he returned to grow up in Nazareth, a small village a long way from the big city. He waited 30 years to begin any public ministry and even then refused to do miracles on demand or overwhelm people with his brilliant intellect. His ministry was small and almost invisible by world standards. Throughout his ministry, Jesus exercised his power carefully so as not to manipulate or force people into following him. 
He revealed just enough of himself to make faith possible, but hid just enough of himself to make faith necessary. Say that again. He revealed just enough of himself to make faith possible, but hid just enough of himself to make faith necessary. Think about it. For his triumphant entry into Jerusalem, he rode not on a magnificent war horse like Alexander the Great, but on a humble donkey. That's like an old Volkswagen. <laughs> Beetle. <laughs> and he allowed himself to be arrested and treated as if he was a common criminal. But it goes on. And we look at the passage from Matthew's Gospel in which Jesus' raw humanity is on powerful display. In the Garden of Gethsemane, we encounter a weak and vulnerable, broken Jesus. Let's read it. Matthew 26, verse 36. Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to them, Sit here while I go there and pray. And he took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him. And he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little farther, he fell on his face to the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. He went away a second time and prayed, My father, if it's not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. So he left them and went away once more and prayed the third time, saying the same thing. I want you to note this. Jesus did not approach his suffering, the cross and death as a superhero. He faced it, those agonizing moments, revealing his weakness and vulnerability as a normal human being. He was a real human being, not God in a Spider-Man outfit. He was human. He felt the things that we felt and feel. And as he hung on the cross in the worst moment of his earthly life, his final prayer was a question he quoted from the Psalms. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now those are the only words you speak if you really feel you're alone. And that's what he felt. He felt totally abandoned by everyone. Even his father. Another thing that I believe we need to do is embrace the gift of our limp. Now you might be wondering what that means. Well, I'm going to make it clear. Paul isn't the only one to whom God gave the gift of a handicap, which is how the Message Bible translates thorn in the flesh. Almost every believer has something that drives them to their knees on a daily basis. Let me name some of them. What is it for you? A child with special needs? An addiction? Emotional fragility with a tendency to depression, anxiety, loneliness? Scars on your soul from an abusive past. Childhood patterns of relating to other people that cause you to feel desperate for change. A physical disability, cancer. Or chronic temptations to anger, hate, resentment, unforgiveness, and judgmentalism. I could go on, but I thought that's depressing enough and just about touches everybody in this room. Early in my Christian life and ministry, 
I believed God wanted to heal my weakness and my frailties completely. I had this picture. He's going to take it all away. You see, I didn't understand what Paul understood. That God's power is my strength. God's not looking for me to be powerful. He's my strength. It never occurred to me that those weaknesses that I had might be part of God's design as it had been for Paul. We live in a funny mixture of theology in our time where it's, you know, it's, you ask somebody, how are you? I'm blessed! <laughs> really? You're blessed. Tell me about your blessings. And then you hear all the weaknesses and the brokenness that comes out. We live in a world where, a Christian world, where we, we're not honest with one another. We, we build ourselves a little cocoon. And people got to look at us and they got to be so impressed with how glued we are together. The only problem the glue we create doesn't work. So vulnerability is something we all share as human beings. After 55 years of ministry, I've never shaken the hand of a perfect Christian or hugged a perfect Christian yet. Have you? Believe me, it's not going to happen. Not this side of eternity. According to a, a German theologian, I think he's German, Jürgen Moltmann, he says there's no dif differentiation between the healthy and those with dis disabilities. When I read that, I said, huh? But then as he went on, I said, oh, I get it. For every human life has its limitations, vulnerabilities, and weaknesses. We are born needy, and we die helpless. Now, for those of you at 20, 25 to 30, you don't understand what death is yet. Um, but um, <laughs> those of us who have moved on a little bit, we... We become more so as we get older, living with increasing degrees of limitations and impairness. I can't run away from trouble, because I can't run anymore. I, I shared a little while ago that I, I tried running a couple of months ago. My legs don't understand what it means to run. <laughs> there was a time if I fell, I would choop, and I'm on my feet. Now when I fall, I, I look around for things to pick up first while I recover. <laughs> and then I have to get into certain positions and find something to hold on to to get myself up. I have a feeling it's not going to get better. So I work real hard at not falling. <laughs> you know, when I was young, I never thought I'd ever be that weak. <laughs> I mean, recently I tried to pick up a bag of cement. All that happened was that I blew gas. <laughs> you think that's funny? <laughs> when that happens in a public place, it's not so funny. <laughs> uh, 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 you know, life is interesting, it really is. Eh? But join me and get old with me because um, we're going to laugh a lot before we pass out from this life. 
Now, I want you to understand that God built brokenness and weakness into the fabric of all life when he set in motion the consequences of the fall. We need to understand that sin has consequences. And the thing that happened in the Garden of Eden had consequences for the rest of humanity. And so we find that from that point forward, God declares that all relationships would be marked by pain and misunderstanding. And even in the best communities, and all the work would be marked by frustration and a sense of incompleteness. If you, if you read Genesis and you, and you just listen to yourself on a Monday when you're going to work, sounds very similar. And he did this so that our weakness would drive us to seek him and to recognize our need for him as our savior. There'll be nothing perfect this side of heaven. Just settle on that one. If you pray in this life, Lord, make me perfect, he will, once you're dead. <laughs> now, while the world treats weakness and failure as a liability, God sees our weakness and our vulnerability as a gift. Weakness and failure cuts across all ages, cultures, races, and social classes. I can tell you today with all honesty, you and I are weak. We are vulnerable. None of us is perfect. Isn't that nice? Now, vulnerability is risky. It can be really scary to lower your defenses and open your life to others. When you reveal your failures, feelings, frustrations, and fears, you risk rejection, even in the church. Oh, I, don't, I don't think I want to be part of their group. Their group, they all seem to be weak and vulnerable. I want to go to a holier-than-thou group where it's, hallelujah, praise the Lord, we're all great. And we're all wearing masks. But the benefits are really worth it. It's worth the risk. Being vulnerable means being relieved of the stress that comes with trying to put up a front. Gee, it's a, it's a great step forward. Do you know how hard it is to, to be a fake all the time? You've got to remember all your lies. You know? It's, it's rough. And you've got to remember the, the stories of strength that you told other people. You've got to remember exactly how you said it because otherwise they know you were lying. Life is tough, eh? Is it any wonder that the scripture tells us that the weakness of God is stronger than human strength and that God chooses the weak things of the world to shame the strong. There's a scripture about this one. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 25. This foolish plan of God is wiser than the wisest of human plans. And God's weakness is stronger than the greatest of human strength. Remember dear brothers and sisters that few of you were wise in the world's eyes or powerful or wealthy when God called you. Instead, God chose the things, of this, the, the things the world considers foolish in order to shame those who think they are wise. And he chose things that are powerless to shame those who are powerful. When God called me when I was 13, I lived in a very poor family. We ate a lot of pumpkin and cabbage. But God said, Bing. I can take you and I can fulfill my plans through you. Isn't that fantastic, eh? Now, if he could do that for me, 
do it for anyone else. So I want you to consider people whom you're trying to serve or minister to. We, we all get to play, we all get to minister, but we need to consider this kind of thing. What if all they see is your strengths? Where does that leave them? It leaves them feeling discouraged and unable to measure up to your standard. And if all someone sees in a servant is strength, then there's no encouragement to aspire or to try to be the same. Because they, they look at this fake and say, I can never be like that. But we can be so much encouraged by seeing others and their struggles as well as their strengths. You, you don't build credibility by trying to put on a front of perfection. And we need to understand that. If you're always right and perfect, then you will repel people. No one can stand being around someone who's always right. You build credibility by being honest and vulnerable, not by trying to present a front of perfection. God has always used crackpots, <laughs> guys like you and me, um, to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not us. I want to just say this, that if, if you've held back from, from getting to play, to pray for others, from ministry because you feel you're inadequate, you're weak, you're vulnerable, you're exactly what God is looking for. He's not looking for those who are fakes. Because they're going to mess up his church. They're going to think the sun shines out of there. And it doesn't. He takes the weak things. And he fulfills his, his dreams through them. So stop running away from God. And from what he has for you. If you're feeling weak, amazing, he's your strength. 2 Corinthians 4, 7. We now have this light shining in our hearts, but we ourselves are like fragile clay jars containing this great treasure. This makes it clear that our great power is, not, is from God, not from ourselves. Whatever we do successfully in God's world, it's by his power, not by ours. Anything we do out of our own strength will never last. So, get this one. Ministry is not dependent on my or your strength, but on God's strength. And look how great God is. He can use you and me to build his kingdom. God looks for the weak, the vulnerable. Because we will have to trust him in order to do what he wants us to do. But those who are proud and full of themselves, they will trust in themselves. As I conclude, I'd like you to think of the interesting example of Jacob. You remember Jacob? Some of you do, at least four people. Uh, he at one time wrestled all night with God. And he told God that he wouldn't let go, let him go, unless God blessed him. And God was prepared to bless him. But before doing it, God grabbed his hip and dislocated Jacob's hip. So Jacob walked with a limp for the rest of his life. Normally the thigh muscle is the strongest in the body. If you don't believe it, ask anyone who's in the medical profession. It's strong. God took that and turned it into a weakness so that Jacob could never run away from God. He could limp away, but he could never, he could never run, eh? And he had to lean on God whether he liked it or not. Are you willing to go forward 
with a limp in your life. If you want God's blessing and for him to use you greatly, you must be willing to live with a limp. Because God loves to use weak people. He may never take your weakness away, but he'll use it for his glory. That kind of messes with our brains, doesn't it? Because we think if you become a believer, oh, it's instantly perfection. You'll never sin again. You know, I hear these people, you know, they, they say, well, I gave my life to Jesus and my sins have been removed. I don't sin anymore. So why does the Bible say, confess your sins to one another? It's written in the, to New Testament Christians. Because we're in the process. We're not as clean cut as we think we are. Even if we did have a haircut recently. There's one thing that I'd like us to understand. That the world will never comprehend the strange wisdom of Jesus' counter-cultural kingdom. In which the lost are first. The weak are blessed. The humble are exalted. The empty are filled. The poor are rich, and where impossibility becomes the occasion for miracles. Real ministry begins with vulnerability. The more you let down your guard and take off your mask and share your struggles, the more God will be able to use you in serving others. Got it? All right, I want to just share a little neat thing with you. John Wimber, the guy who put Vineyard on the map, he said these kind of words, never follow a leader who does, who does not walk with a limp. In other words, who shows no weakness or vulnerability. Because you're going to be misled. And so I take it when we all walk out of here today, this is how we're leaving the church. <laughs> we're going to limp out together to show one another, yes, we are weak and vulnerable, but in Christ, we are strong. Right? Okay, that's great. Next week, you get part two.